The National Soccer Coaches Association of America is proud to be the world's largest soccer coaches organization and the NSCAA is proud to bring you the October 29, 2013 edition of the weekly college highlights and ranking show. 11,000 plus watch Cal Poly and UCSB this week in San Luis Obispo and we bring it to you next right here on NSCAA TV. In a match that sold all 11,075 seats 31 hours prior to kickoff, Paul Hollers, Mustangs, and Tim Bombsteeg's Gauchos played to a 1-1 tie in front of the 10th largest crowd to ever watch a regular season college game. And this beautiful header from freshman Justin Dillon set the tone for a magical night that would finish in a 1-1 tie. Unbelievable action in Cal Poly. And we kick it off right there from our Continental Tire Studios in Chapel Hill. Hello, everybody. I'm Dean Linke, and what a great night in Cal Poly, and what an incredible week it has been in college soccer. Let's get it rolling right now and tell you what we have in store today. Indeed, it is going to be a big, big show. First off, for the men's highlights, let's see what we've got. We'll visit with UCLA coach Jorge Salcedo after a big win over Washington, but Jamie Clark, so magnanimous, will also join us on the show. How about the success of Dougie Allison and Furman. It's been incredible. LIU Post under Andreas Lindbergh is doing a great job and Herkimer County Community College going for a three-peat under Pepe Aragon who has six titles already and will have all the rankings and the players of the week on the men's side. Then we'll get to the women's side and another exciting Women's portion, we'll take a look at the Virginia win over Florida State. How about the job Greg Ryan, the former U.S. national team coach, is doing at Michigan? We'll look at the rise of the UMBC women under Leslie Ray. They're not the only soccer program in Baltimore doing great. We'll take a look at Pete Fels, Division Three Wheaton women, and then also NJCAA's Monroe College. All the rankings and players of the week right here on NSCAA TV. And I'm delighted to have back in the studio my good friend and former Davidson coach Charlie Slagle. And Charlie, unbelievable week of action in men's college soccer and women's for that matter. In Division I, it just happens every week in the men. Last week, the top 25, they come in, they're 19, 12, and 7. Parity, we've been talking about it all year. We continue to talk about it. Nobody keeps winning. There's no undefeated teams. It is amazing. You know, teams with four, five, six ties in the season. And that's with 20 minutes of overtime. All right, let's take a look at the storylines we will be covering today, Charlie. No yes. more undefeated teams as Cal, Notre Dame, and Washington all fall. Penn State, Bob Warming, 5-0 and in the Big Ten, coming back to beat Northwestern in overtime. And George Gelnovich has the Cavaliers on a hot streak. No question. Uh, the Cavaliers uh, beat Notre Dame 2-0. Uh, uh, a great week for them. And now Notre Dame's got to go down to play Wake Forest, another tough test. Let's take a look here now at the top 10 in men's division one and UCLA still at number three, but they are creeping up as all three teams, California, Notre Dame and Washington suffer their first loss. Right. UCLA did tie Oregon State, but then defeated Washington two to one. They're at Stanford and at Cal this week. So once again, it gets tough. It stays tough. It's tough all year. All right, you see Maryland, Penn State, and UAB with UCLA at number three. Let's take a look at the success of Jorge Salcedo doing a fantastic job at UCLA. He's now in his 10th season. Now remember, in every year he's been at UCLA as the head coach, they made the NCAA, and he was a player back in 1990 when they won the national championship under the great Ziggy Schmidt, now the head coach of the Seattle Sounders. And I talked to Jorge Salcedo about his big win on Sunday. You know, it was a great game yesterday. Washington obviously was undefeated. Uh, coming down here to UCLA, and we were very familiar with them, playing them last Monday night um, in Seattle. And so uh, it was a great result for us. The guys did a fantastic job to deal with uh, some of the challenges that they present as a team. Really proud of, of our efforts. Uh, we 
had been a little bit unlucky the previous few weeks, but uh, continued to fight and work hard. And like I told him yesterday, that we, at some point, uh, our luck was going to change, and it did yesterday with a 2-1 victory. All right, hard to believe you've been there 10 years now. You played there. You were an assistant coach. I mean, UCLA is your life. Why is it such a special place? Well, you know, it's, it's a place that I've been around my entire life. Uh, my father was an assistant coach here in 1978, and you know, I was only six years old when, uh, when I put on my first UCLA tracksuit and was uh, a school that I always knew I wanted to come to. Being a part of uh, the 1985 National Championship as a ball boy, I'll never forget being in the, the locker room before the game. I still remember what Ziggy Schmidt said to the team prior to the game against American University. And it just was, uh, was always a place that was uh, dear and fond, uh, fond of my heart and a place that uh, I knew that I wanted to be a part of the tradition. And, and very fortunately, uh, I was a part of the team in 1990, which won the national championship as well. Coach, if you look at the conference, you've got three teams in the top ten. It's been fantastic. Talk about the play in the Pac-12. Yeah, it's uh, it's been great to see what Cal has done. Uh, Kevin Grimes had a couple tough years in rebuilding up in Berkeley, but uh, he has a very strong team, a, a, a organized team, a team that's got some great senior leadership. Uh, Jamie Clark at Washington, like I said, they were unbeaten prior to yesterday's match, and They've, uh, he's done a great job bringing in really good athletes and good players to, to make them a, a really competitive program. So uh, I, I, everyone talks about Cal and Stanford, UCLA, excuse me, Cal and Washington, but obviously Stanford's having a great year. You know, San Diego State and Oregon State, uh, they're not teams that are easy to go and, and beat in, in their, uh, uh, at their programs and at their fields. And so... Really proud of what we've done in the Pac-12, and it's obviously been a great uh, great season thus far. Coach, good luck in the NCAA tournament. I do believe you've got a team that can make a long run. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, we, uh, we're a team that has had some, some issues, some injury issues, and you, you, know, you just got to keep fighting and battling through them. And so we, uh, we're really excited to see what happens. I still think that we haven't hit uh, our, our stride yet, which – Kind of sounds strange, but it takes time, and, and, and we're finding out which guys to plug in certain parts of the field, and we're becoming more comfortable and I think better as a team. Coach, you've done a lot of great things, but the first time you've ever Skyped, how are you feeling? <laughs> um, it's, it's unique, but I'll be ready for the next time, Dean. All right, Coach, all the best. Thanks for being with us here on the program. No problem. Take care. Jorge Salcedo, such a good man. Speaking of good men, Jamie Clark, even after that tough loss against UCLA, was willing to join us. Look at his second season, of course, the son of Notre Dame head coach Bobby Clark. Big ties this year already, tying UConn and UCLA. Their only loss on the season on Sunday to the Bruins. And, Dean, Jamie Clark was just as gracious as his father, the Notre Dame coach uh, Bobby Clark. Even after his first loss, he was kind enough uh, to talk uh, with you yesterday. And what a job Jamie Clark has done at Washington. Coach, 11-1-4 on the season. Tough loss against UCLA on Sunday, but what a great season so far. Oh, it's been a fantastic year for us. We, you know, it's been enjoyable the whole way. When you play in a good conference, you know you're going to pick up a few losses here and there, and UCLA is a great team. Um, there's five other really good teams, so uh, it will be neck and neck all the way down to the line in this Pac-12 season. Coach, your team has seven players with at least nine points on the season. What great balance. Uh, it's, been, it's been fun to coach because there's a lot of different guys who can step up and score in different ways. Center backs off of set pieces, a um, couple really good fast forwards, and a couple really good box finishers. So, you know, if that team focuses on any one aspect of our game, I think we can get them um, in a different way. Coach, for almost the entire season, you've been neck and neck in the polls with your father, Bobby Clark's Notre Dame team. Any talk with your dad about that or even trash talk? And talk about his role in your development as a head coach because it's been written that your dad didn't think you would be a coach. You know, the funniest thing is before the conference realignment, we were supposed to be going to Notre Dame this coming weekend to play them. So it would have been a great game. Um, we talk all the time. And, and, and you know, it's, it's one of those things neither of us like to look at the polls, even though we do. You know, you try to focus just on the team and the games at hand, but the polls are incredibly important, and, uh, and they do. They bring confidence and belief to your team. So, uh, you know, if we're neck and neck all the way to the to finish line, then, you know, we're both going to be very happy. But, you know, if he wins the national championship this year, I, I'll be delighted. If we win one, I know he'll be delighted for us. 
Well, that leads me to your final question. Why do you think this Husky team can make some noise in the NCAA tournament? You know, again, it's that balance, and, and we're not a one-trick pony. Uh, you know, we, we, we certainly are very good at set pieces, and every team fears from us in that. But, you know, we scored 30 goals, and, and a lot of them are out of the run of play. We've got dynamic attacking players um, We can that can break you down off the dribble. We've got great box finishing. You know, we can hold on to the ball. So, you know, a team that can do a lot of different things is tough to defend. So, uh, I, you know, I'm hopeful, and I think we can do something special in, uh, come the postseason. Coach, thanks for being with us, especially after a tough loss. It's been a great season so far for the Huskies. Thanks so much, Dean. Good stuff from Jamie Clark. As you look at 11 through 20, Louisville comes in at number 11, Charlie. Yeah, they had a great win at, uh, at Memphis, and you and I have been there, and that's a tough place to, uh, to play, especially when the lights stay on. Uh, we, had to, we had to survive a 30-minute rain uh, delay there. But, uh, yeah, a good, uh, a good win for Louisville and Ken Lola's team. And... Furman has had a great year, and um, they're going to be uh, playing this week on Saturday against their arch rival Wofford right up the road. Yeah, Furman indeed has produced the great Clem Dempsey. is making some major noise as Doug Allison has Furman playing some big-time soccer. Half of Furman University and Furman University Athletics, welcome to all NSCAA TV viewers to Furman as we talk about our men's soccer program today. We're very proud of all of our teams, but certainly the one that Doug Allison, our men's soccer coach, has put together over the years. He's put together another great team this year. They're in the top of the national rankings in collegiate soccer, and as always, they're tops in the classroom here at Furman, too. We want you to meet one of those fine young men from Furman Soccer and also our head coach, Doug Allison. I think one of the important things about me coming to Furman is that it's really set me up in, in both areas of soccer and, and school. Um, I have an opportunity to maybe go to uh, graduate school at Vanderbilt, and I also have an opportunity to, to maybe go to the MLS Combine and, and see how far I can, I can take my soccer career too. So that's been one of the greatest things about Furman. One of my favorite memories, two of my favorite memories, <laughs> is your goal against Clemson and your goal against uh, Clemson again yeah. this year, last year and this year, not only because you got to score the two winning goals, but because you were set up by your the same teammate both times in, in Martin. Last year, um, I think it was it was a cross from Martin. Um, we were down 2-0 against Clemson, uh, clawed our way back, went to overtime, it was 2-2, and um, just got a cross in the box and, and put it away. That was from Martin. And then this year again, uh, similar situation. Uh, we were up 1-0. And then uh, Martin, we kind of had a sneaky little trick play up our sleeves. So uh, that uh, fortunately turned out well for us. And again, coming from across from Martin, I was able to put it in. Um, so I guess I, I owe him dinner or something. But uh, yeah, both those crosses came from Martin. Why Greenville? Why Furman? You've been here a long time. Been here 19 years. Uh, had um, a good upbringing with Coach Burson in South Carolina. And uh, he taught me a lot. And I've put a lot of that into what I've done here and found a home here. And um, been very happy with the guys we've got, and, and not only are the guys here doing well, but you know, in the middle of a pregame meal last week, we're turning on the TV and Walker Zimmerman is marking Clint Dempsey in an MLS game. So that, we're really proud of what we produce, and and the the fan base and the alumni have been fantastic. I mean, Neil Cronin's and Scott Hoker are organizing teams uh, up at Davidson. Graham Seagrove is having it at his house, and and to see the alumni coming back uh, to every game, and to see the the students, uh, the 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 firm and fury, we call them, dress up and uh, screaming at games. And we're averaging 1,500 to almost 2,000 a game now. For a small school, that's really good. And at Clemson last week, we must have brought almost 1,000 people to their place, painted up. The president was in the crowd. It's a great atmosphere. And uh, I think the stadium lends itself to having a great atmosphere. Uh, you've got several games left. And then we're hosting the Southern Conference Tournament here. That's big for firm and big for the program. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting time. I mean, we've put ourselves in a pretty decent position. Uh, being the top ten in the country in a couple of polls uh, is fantastic. Uh, testament to the, the guys and how hard they're working, and this program is built on hard work. Congratulations to Coach Allison and the entire Furman soccer program. How about William & Mary? We'll actually feature them on NSCA-TV a week from tomorrow 
November 6th as they welcome in James Madison. You'll see that game right here on NSCAA TV. And three Big Ten teams at 22, 23, and 25. Wisconsin John Trass team actually beat Michigan State one to nothing on Sunday. Northwestern fell to Bob Warming's Penn State Nittany Lions team in overtime, giving Penn State that Big Ten title. But Big Ten represents right there in the final five. No question, and it's all across the country. It's incredible what we have this year, Dean. We have 48 teams under the selection committee, the NCAA selection committee is going to have to go with, and it's going to be tough naming the top 16, which they have to do because they get buys, and deciding on who's number 45 through 48 and who's number 49 through 54, or even further, because it is parity central. Our Disney Soccer NSCA Division I Player of the Week is Ali al from Gardner-Webb, the sophomore midfielder from Norway, helped to extend the running Bulldogs' current winning streak to four as he totaled six points on two goals and two assists on the week. Today's show is presented by Continental Tire, innovative technology, driving confidence. Learn more at ContinentalTire.com. And that'll do it for Men's Division One. You just talked a little bit about the parity, but exciting times right now for sure. Right, and we get into the conference tournaments, and those conference tournaments, yes, the winner does go, but in a lot of those cases, the winner's going to have to get there to, to get there because it's going to be tough for the selection committee. They've done it year after year, but this is going to be a tough year. Of course, it's also been a great week for the crowds, including the great fans at Cal Poly. Let's show the appreciation for the wonderful fans for Paul Holler as we send it to break here on NSCAA TV. There's a reason soccer is called the beautiful game. Experience it live at the 2013 NCAA Women's College Cup, December 6th and 8th at WakeMed Soccer Park in Cary, North Carolina. Affordable tickets now available at NCAA.com slash Women's College Cup. Tire, the official tire of Major League Soccer. Tra la la tra la tra la pleasure. Welcome back to the Continental Tire Studios in Chapel Hill. Dean Linky along with Charlie Slago as we're rolling along covering men's college soccer. And Charlie, time now to look at the Division II Top 10 for men. Let's take a look at uh, your number one team, and it's down in Florida, Rollins. Right, and you'll see in a lot of cases, a lot of number twos became number ones this week. Rollins, the Tars, uh, Keith Buckley's team, went from two to, them to one, two five-nil victories against Palm Beach Atlantic, and Eckert got them there. LIU Post is number six, and Ian Schreier has more on the Pioneers. In conjunction with NSCA.com, I'm here with the head coach of the LIU Post men's soccer team, Andreas Lindbergh, and one of our senior defenders, Eric Biorno. Coach, let's talk about uh, the team overall first. Uh, your team's off to a hot start. Uh, it seems that the team just has had a lot of chemistry going. What do you feel has been the main contributor to why the team's been playing so well? Uh, we have a lot of senior players and a lot of guys that are returning. It's been here for uh, you know three and four years. Uh, it's a close knit group. Um, I think that's a big reason. One of the players that's obviously been uh, the key, one of the key contributors to the team, has been uh, one of the leading scorers in all of Division Two, Avon Dosbo. Can you talk about a little bit why uh, Avon's been such a huge contributor? I know he had lost a season last year to a season-ending concussion, and now he came back and scored 21 straight games with a goal, so uh, right. dating back to last year. So why do you feel he's had so much success? Uh, well, he's a great player, that's the reason. Uh, but also <laughs> the, the way we play, you know, we, we do get him a lot of chances inside 18, and when we do, he finishes them. Uh, he's a great finisher, uh, he's great in the air, he's big and strong and physical, and it's difficult to deal with him. There's games where he can go silent, and he doesn't do much for 75, 80, 85, and 89 minutes, but all he needs is that one chance. And, a lot of time this year has been putting him away. 
Eric, let's move over to you. Let's talk a little bit about the defensive uh, side of the field. Your team has been, you and your team have been holding uh, the opposition to less than a goal per game. What's been so different, or what's been more the same about the defense compared to last year in the, during this year? Uh, we moved players a little bit around. We use uh, one of the guys who played center back last year, played on the right back. Now we have uh, the Ron Haywood, who's been in, been there for a while. Uh, together with Marco Jorgensen, who's probably the best goalkeeper in Division 2. Um, and a combination of all that and, and, and the fact that we have played together for, for three and four years now uh, makes a big difference, and that's the reason why we kind of uh, work so well together. In a way. Coach, it seems like your team, you're always putting out a great starting 11 out there, but it always seems like you still have some great players coming off the bench, no matter who you start and who you put out there, even for substitutions. Uh, has that been just a main contributor to your success uh, more than anything else? Well, yeah, absolutely. I think we're deeper this year than we've been in the past. Uh, we also make a point of it's not necessarily if you're starting the game or not. There's guys that are not starting the game but still playing 60, 70 minutes. So it's a little bit of we're trying to rotate them. We have you know, 16, 17 guys on the team that can start in any given day and depending on if we're healthy and how the form is on individual players and also a little bit about the position who we're going to play, we line up a little bit differently. But yeah, I'm very happy with, with the guys and the depth that we've been showing this year. Well, Coach and Eric, uh, you know, congratulations on all your success and best of luck the rest of the way. Thank, Thank you. you. And Neil McCabe from Young Harris, the junior forward from Dublin, Ireland, led the Mountain Lions to their first Peach Belt Conference regular season championship with four goals and three assists in two games last week. McCabe now leads the PBC in assists with 14 on the year, and he's your Disney Soccer NSCAA Division II Player of the Week. Let's take a look now at NCAA Men's Division Three rankings, Charlie. And another team moving up from number two to number one, and that's the Lord Jeffs of Amherst, Justin Serpone's team. They did that by winning 1-0 against Western New England, and uh, so they are now the number one team in the country. What a great top three with Amherst, Ohio Westland, and Messiah, which is all these there. We covered Wisconsin Oshkosh just a couple weeks ago right here on this program. Your Disney Soccer Division Three Player of the Week is Travis Vagter from Calvin College, the junior forward from Hudsonville, Michigan. Notched two goals and an assist in a 5-1 win over Adrian on October 23rd, and then came up with a hat trick in Calvin's 3-2 overtime win a few days later. Vector ranks amongst the national leaders in goals and points and now has 23 season goals, three assists, and an amazing 49 points. During the Disney Soccer Showcase, athletes have the opportunity to play in front of the top college coaches across the country. Teams who compete at the ESPN Wide World of Sports Complex will receive the first class service that only Disney can offer. To apply for the Disney Soccer Showcase or learn more about the Disney Soccer Youth Tournaments, visit us today at DisneySoccer.com. Time now to talk NAIA and a lot of news in NAIA, Charlie. In NAIA news, Ron Pulvers of Cal State San Marcos earned his 200th career coaching victory. He becomes the 20th active coach with 200 or more wins and the 17 of those coaches to have accumulated all of his wins with one NAIA program. And it was a weekend for upsets around the top 25 with number 14 William Carey from Mississippi claiming a share of the Southern States Athletic Conference lead at 8-1-0 with a 2-0 win over number 9 Bellhaven, also of Mississippi. Number 15 Mid-American uh, Nazarene from Kansas earned a share of the Heart of America Athletic Conference lead 5-1-1 with a 1-0 victory over number 4 Benedictine, also of Kansas. And number 25 Thomas of Georgia remained undefeated in the Sun Conference with a 2-1 win over Embry-Riddle from Florida. Thomas still sits in the conference, uh, a second in the conference at 7-0-2 behind the Eagles at 9-1-0. Great stuff, Charlie. Let's take a quick look at Junior College Division One. is what we'll begin with. And in the JCs, the uh, top teams just keep rolling along. Iowa Western just keeps it moving, and they stay at number one. San Jacinto College jumps one ahead of Tyler Junior College, Coach Clemens' program down there. Yavapai at number eight, the home of Roger Espinoza, and at number 10, UC Peninsula. How about NJCAA Division Three? Well, it may be uh, spelling doom because uh, Herkimer is hosting the uh, NCAA, uh, the Junior College Division Three Championships, and they stay on top where they've been most of the year. All right, good stuff there. As you also see, Hartnell College at number nine, and De Anza College at number ten. That is Division Three, but all on there at number one. 
Pepe Aragon, the head coach at Herkimer County Community College. He's in his 16th season with the men's soccer program. His team has a 12-1 overall record. They're 9-0 in Region 3 and are ranked number one nationally in the NSCA poll. And his team plays tonight at 6 p.m. in the Region 3 playoffs at their home stadium. Coach Aragon will be looking for his 16th consecutive Region 3 championship. Herkimer has won nine overall junior college national championships, and Aragon has been a head coach for six of them. And Giorgio Valaro, reporting for NSCA TV, asked Pepe about what he thought his chances are of three-peating since they won the national championships in 2011 and 2012. The key to this year's success has really been our, our senior leadership, and that starts with Pete McAvoy, uh, our six-foot-two central back out of Dundee, Scotland. Came into preseason in great shape. Uh, is a great leader both on and off the field, um, a great organizer, is great with his feet, is great in the air, um, and he's a big part of our, our defense and organizing, organizing it. But it, as well, he's also our leading goal scorer uh, with 10 goals right now, and uh, so he's not just doing it on the defensive side, he's doing it on the offensive side as well. Um, I can't really say that we've done anything differently. I think there's been a lot more um, responsibility put on my shoulders this year as being a sophomore and being the captain. But really, we've got a few set pieces and things. I've just been in the right place at the right time. Got good um, balls coming into the box. Nothing's really different there, just kind of taking our chances this year. We're going to hit the Region 3 playoffs uh, on Tuesday. It's one of the toughest regions in the country, you know, so we open up on Tuesday night and, you know, hopefully can get through our region and get ready for the, the national tournament. Being a, a two year school, uh, half of our team has already, you know, gone and moved on and to their four year schools. So, the new group, um, you know, they're really not, they're not too aware of it. We, we try not to, to talk about the words uh, three-peat too often, um, but we really have to get through our, our regional tournament um, to qualify for the national tournament. And then anytime you get into a national tournament, there's always luck that has to occur for you in uh, any of the national championships I've been a part of. Uh, luck has to be on your side as far as uh, injuries, uh, weather, um, possibly officials' calls, things of that nature. So... Um, we're just focused on our Region 3 tournament, and then we can put our focus on the national tournament. This is Giorgio Valaro. I'm reporting from NSCAA TV. The new fall flooring styles are here, and we've got them on sale now at Lumber Liquidators. Save on new hand-scraped and exotic hardwood, bamboo, laminate, and more. Choose from 53 floors under $2 a square foot. Don't wait. Sales going on now at Lumber Liquidators. Each year, the NSCAA puts over 7,000 coaches through our coaching education program. Youth, high school, and college coaches at all levels participate in the diploma courses. Join your peers and get educated. Better coaching, better players, better game. NSCAA Coaching Academy. Improving soccer, one coach at a time. Register today at nscaa.com education. Time to talk women here on the NSCAA Weekly College Highlights and Ranking Show. And how about Virginia? They remained unbeaten with a big golden goal from Michigan State transfer Annie Steinleg to push Steve Swanson and the Cavaliers to 18-0. We'll also spend time with Michigan head coach Greg Ryan, who has a chance to give Michigan their first ever Big Ten title. How about the rise of the UMBC women's program doing a fantastic job? And then we'll visit with Division III's Wheaton women, led by Pete Felsk, who's done an amazing job in 20-plus years. We'll head to New York to visit with the Junior College Power Monroe College. We'll have all the rankings and the players of the week as we welcome back Charlie Slagle, staying with us here to cover men and women today in Virginia. What a story, 18-0. and 0. Yeah, big win against Florida State. Weapons upon weapons upon weapons. They have three players, at least three players, are going to end the season with over 10 goals. It just doesn't happen anymore, and uh, they have been very impressive. I've seen them play. Uh, they can attack from all different angles, plus they're great defensively. They are a great team. You're looking at it. Four of the top five in the country are ACC teams, and they've played them all and have won. All right, let's take a look at the storylines we're covering. Of course, Virginia is at the top. As you mentioned, Morgan Bryan with 10 goals and 12 assists. Mackenzie Doniak with 13 goals and 5 assists. Brittany Ratcliffe with 11 goals and 1 assist. And that's part of the reason why 
they're still unbeaten. How about Nebraska and UM? Penn State has won the Big Ten title too many years to count. They can't win it this year. And here's the deal. Nebraska has Indiana if they tie or lose, and Michigan beats Ohio State. That'll give Greg Ryan and Michigan their first ever Big Ten title. Florida and Texas A&M are atop the SEC, and Tiffany roberts Sahada keeps getting it done in her first year at UCF, taking over for Amanda Cromwell. Let's take a look now, Charlie, at the women's top ten. As you mentioned, a big ACC flavor. No question. Four of the top five. And I did say they played them all, Virginia. They have not. They have their arch rival, Virginia Tech. Uh, this week and uh, that ends the ACC uh, regular season and then they start playing their tournament on Sunday with uh, home sites and then they play in Cary right down the road from here in the semifinals and finals but FSU they've had a great year UCLA the only non ACC team in that uh, top five and then you go back out to the West Coast where Portland is number six after uh, uh, defeating um, uh, USD you mentioned UCLA. There they sit at number two. And our star reporter, Larissa White, caught up with Amanda Cromwell and the UCLA women's soccer program. UCLA has always been a national powerhouse when it comes to women's soccer. In fact, the Bruins are 47-16-2 all-time in NCAA tournament competition. And by the way, the 2013 campaign is looking. Their domination will certainly continue. The UCLA women's soccer team is consistent. They've enjoyed a season-long presence in the NSCAA's top five, and for the third straight week, the Bruins are ranked number two in the country. Success starts at the top in first-year head coach Amanda Cromwell. By the end of the 2012 season, Cromwell had accumulated 224 career victories and a 681 winning percentage for her time as a coach prior to her arrival to Los Angeles. She currently ranks amongst the top 30 all-time winning as coaches in NCAA history. Cromwell certainly plans to keep her winning ways. She's instilled in her new team a defensive mindset that lays the foundation of its consistency. As of October 24th, UCLA had only allowed five goals from opponents thanks to a defense that leads the nation with an approximate .32 goals against average. Additionally, junior goalkeeper Caitlin Rowland and her Bruin teammates are responsible for 10 shutouts in their first 15 games. Cromwell also says that her midfielders and forwards excel in the finesse game that makes up West Coast offense. Twelve Bruins have contributed goals this season, led by freshman Darian Jenkins, who paces the team with over 20 points so far this season. A combination of stellar defense and a quick strike offense has allowed the Bruins to outscore their opponents 29-5 in their first 15 games. In the past three weeks, they have handed two previously unbeaten teams their first losses of the season. Despite a tough schedule and its second-ranked RPI, UCLA continues to dominate. The Blue and Gold have trailed in only two games this season for a total of 15 minutes. With a roster of 33 Bruins, this team definitely has a solid foundation for the future. The Bruins have three games left in the regular 2013 season and all will be played at home in the confines of Drake Stadium. With an edge in its step, it's sure to be an exciting last stretch for UCLA. For NSCAATV.com, I'm Larissa White. Thanks, Larissa. Another great job by Larissa. Greg Ryan is showing us all why he once led the U.S. women's team. He's doing a great job at Michigan, and he also caught up with Dean after another big Wolverine weekend. And we're now joined by Greg Ryan in his sixth season as the head coach of the Michigan women. And after Sunday's 3-0 win over Northwestern, the Wolverines are 14-2-1 overall and 8-1-1 in the Big Ten. And if they can beat Ohio State, and first place Nebraska ties or loses to Indiana. It would be the first ever Big Ten title for the Michigan women. Exciting times for your program, Coach. Well, it really is, and I'm just so proud of the whole team. And it, it starts with our senior class. This was the group, our first full recruiting class, and they're joined by fifth-year senior Holly Hine. It's just a tremendous group that came in, uh, got to the NCAA tournament in their first year, and we were carried by freshmen. And now they're all seniors, and they're just doing a fantastic job leading this team, performing well. And now our younger players are starting to catch up and learn how to play in with them. And so we've kind of caught our stride here at the end of the season. Now, as we look at the highlights of your team, Coach, it's hard not to notice Kem as Arike with 10 goals and 8 assists on the season. She has been dynamic. Kim is a fabulous player. I wish I had another 20 years with her playing for me. Um, she's a highlight reel for goals. And 
Uh, you know, she is the key player that we need to play through. You know, you mentioned 10 goals, but it's the eight assists that she's creating goals for her teammates as well. And this year, we have more people chipping in, which is allowing her to get more assists, maybe take a little bit of pressure off of her in terms of, you know, everybody's double teaming her, but now they've got to watch out for some other people too. Finally, Coach, the facilities for Michigan are now phenomenal. Talk about Michigan's commitment to women's and men's soccer. It's been fabulous. You know, it started with building that facility because my first year we didn't even have a field to practice on, to play on. We, It was crazy. But they had made the commitment to us that they would build us a great stadium, and they did. And, you know, and I would say the commitment from Michigan's administration – to their Olympic sports is just fabulous across the board. So we're, we're very, very fortunate. We've got a great home in that uh, Michigan soccer stadium. Ashaka Daly's doing a great job with our men's program. And uh, we're very fortunate to be where we are. Greg Ryan, head coach of the Michigan women. Good luck in the Big Ten tournament, the NCAAs, and next weekend as you go for that first ever regular season title at Michigan. Thanks so much, Dean. Appreciate it. What a job he has done there now in his sixth season. As we mentioned, the former head coach of the U.S. women's national team and getting great production. We saw the highlights there of Kem Ezariki, 10 goals and 8 assists on the season. Michigan, the number 8 team in the country. Today's interview with Michigan head coach Greg Ryan and all the other interviews and features on this program are presented by Shattuck St. Mary's, a college prep boarding school with a full-time residential soccer center of excellence for boys and girls and a member of the U.S. Soccer Development Academy. We thank Jesse Fortney and Tim Carter from their beautiful Minnesota-based campus. To learn more, visit www.s-sm.org. Rolling along here, take a look now at 11 through 20, Women Division One. Let's talk about Texas Tech, uh, Tom Stone's team. Uh, they go out and win two games at home against Kansas and against last week's number nine, West Virginia, to move up to 12. Then let's look at uh, Jennifer Rockwood's team, BYU. They go to Gonzaga and they go to Portland and get two 1-0 victories, moving up from 24 to 20. Portland uh, got knocked down from uh, number 6 to number 11 uh, due to that loss to BYU. Take a look here now at the final five for women, Division One at 21, California. And Tony Deleuze and uh, Wake Forest are uh, now uh, at number 23. Trust trying to hold on. They lose their all-time leading scorer, Katie Stengel. Uh, Tony Deleuze will play, play against his uh, longtime assistant, Tim Santoro, in a couple days over at NC State. But they defeated Pitt and lost a close one to UNC 1-2. G. Guerrero's Texas A&M team moves into the top 25. They're a dangerous team. And Pete Gringe's father and son combo for the UMBC men's program is not the only team making noise in Baltimore. The UMBC women's soccer team are part of one of the biggest turnarounds across the country over the past season. Second-year head coach Leslie Ray has helped to change the culture of a team that combined for just eight wins over a five-year span by matching the Retriever's highest win total in program history and a 10-win increase from last season. The Retrievers completed the worst of first Cinderella story on Sunday by capturing a share of the program's first ever regular season title and will enter the America East Championship as the number one seed. We wanted, we, we wanted to focus on changing the culture and I think that's just a mindset. Um, and from day one we said we need to work hard. And I think we worked hard last year, we just didn't have the tools. And so the big difference this year is that our work rate and our work ethic is still the same. Um, but we have some tools now. Like, yeah. I'm not really <clears throat> surprised with it because as soon as Coach Ray came in, right from the start, you knew that like, she, she meant business. Like right from the start, we were getting more fit. So now, like kind of looking at the program, and it's like, oh, are you surprised with this? It's like, I'm not surprised because this is what we worked for. So like you knew she was coming and changing the culture, and so now it's just playing out. Maybe not so much two years ago, but last year we definitely felt, like I felt like we should have had more wins than we did, and now it just, we have so much pride, and I feel like our entire team is just so confident. We walk, like we just feel like winners, and it's exciting, and it just makes playing soccer that much more fun. Also, we walk around with our heads up, and it feels good to be a winner, you know, we're all like, oh, I play the women's soccer team, and it's like, yeah, yeah, I play on the team, you know, you feel so good, and it's just so exciting. And I, people, you talk to JB after she scores a goal, 
and people can't sleep after games because they're so excited. They're what did we just won, we just won, we just beat the first place team and it's everyone's just so excited and it's it's exciting. I think just in general the team attitude is different. Like we're more excited to come out and to play and we wanna be here more as before is more of just oh like we have practice, we have to go up and now we're excited to play. This is a family. Like the UMBC women's soccer team is finally a family. So playing with these girls is like I'm honored to be a part of the team. Well, so I think it's a surprise to to us as a coaching. And I think so, uh, the players are somewhat surprised, you know, at the amount of wins that we've had so far. We know going in, it's going to be a fight, and I think we fight so hard because we know what it's like when we don't. And that's in the previous years of saying. Um, of going in and being like, all right, well, we're going to try to fight, but if it doesn't work, then, you know, whatever, and it's okay. I think this time it's, we know we have to fight for every game because we every game that we've ever fought for, especially these juniors, they've had to play some of their best games. And now that we're doing that, we're coming away with wins. You can feel the energy of Leslie Ray and the Retrievers will look for their first postseason victory since 2001 when they host their America East semifinal contest at Retrievers Soccer Park at 1 p.m. on Sunday, November 3rd. And our Player of the Week is a freshman forward from Furman. Carly Couch scored three goals and added an assist to help Furman to a 2-0-0 record and a Southern Conference regular season title this past weekend. Congratulations to Carly, and we will be back with more from the Continental Tire Studios and the NSCAA Highlights and Rankings Show after these messages. Take aim, America. Focus on your target and not the goalkeeper, and you will score more goals and win more matches. Practicing with the Ultimate Goal Sports Targets is the best way to train you to score more goals. Simply attach the Velcro straps to the net and you are ready for the best shooting practice around. As a special offer, we'll send you a package of two Red Bullseye Ultimate Goal Sports Targets for only $19.99. Sports Targets are also great for helping you hit the mark in baseball, tennis, hockey, lacrosse and more. And for a limited time, we'll double your offer and send you two blue sports targets free. Just pay separate processing and handling. Take aim, America, and improve your game with the ultimate goal sports targets. Here's how to order. Time now to take a look at women's Division II. Charlie Slagle, Dean Linky, let's take a look at the top 10 here. Rolling along on the NSCAA highlights and ranking show, Grand Valley State, your number one team. Yeah, and we've also talked about teams moving up. <clears throat> the Colorado School of the Mines did not move all the way up to number one, but they came from four to two. The Ore Diggers uh, had uh, two victories for Kevin Fickus, uh, Pueblo, uh, four nothing, and State College of Colorado. 3-1 to move up into the second spot. Your last three, American International, Quincy and North Georgia. And your Division II Disney Soccer Player of the Week is Chelsea Palmer. She plays at West Florida and she's a senior forward who scored two goals and had two assists last week and five goals and five assists in her last four games. She now leads the Golf South Conference in points per game and 
assists per game. Congratulations, Chelsea. And how about Hannah Chronic from Johns Hopkins, a player we featured right here on this program. The junior forward scored at least two points in every game over the past week for Hopkins, which included three shutout conference victories. Chronic's second assist against McDaniel made her the all-time leader in points in John Hopkins history, and she moved to second all-time in both goals and points in Centennial history. This is actually her third Disney Soccer NSCA Player of the Week award this season. Let's take a look now at the Division Three Top 10, of course, led by Wheaton. Uh, uh, Wash U is up on top this week, and uh, Jim Connell, I think in St. Louis, they need some of that help. They're down 3-2 uh, in the World Series, so uh, and they love their baseball there. But Jim Conlon, they had an off week and moved up to number one, but they have four away games left in their season, so it's going to be tough to hang on. I feel bad for Wheaton. They actually dropped down three spots, led by longtime coach Pete Felsk. He's in his 26th season. And Charlie Judah Newby filed this report on the Thunder. Over the past decade, the Wheaton Thunder women's soccer program has established itself as one of the winningest programs in the NCAA across all levels. With three national championships and six Final Four appearances since 2004, the bar has been set for this year's team. I, I've always said this, players win games. They find a way to do it. And we've been blessed. Guys bless our program with Good kids, they want to be excellent on the field, they love the Lord, and that's why they're here. Um, the wins won't matter, but they do want to be excellent while they're here. They're competitive, and uh, we've been successful due to the fact that we've got players that want to win games. One of those players is senior Leah DeMoss, who transferred to Wheaton after two seasons at the University of Iowa. After earning All-American status in her first year with the Thunder, DeMoss has found success off the pitch as well. I think the transition was hard, but it was the best decision for me. Um, I love my experience playing at that level, but I think I've learned much more about myself and about myself as a player being here at Wheaton. Coming off its second straight trip to the Final Four, Wheaton has carried that success into 2013, finding itself atop the NSCAA rankings for the first time since 2007, a feat that has not been lost on the Thunder. We've had uh, history of doing this, we've been having that, you know, been one of the top five, ten teams in the country for a while now, so we know it's there, but this year it's hit us a little bit, a little bit more than in others. Wheaton's success has not come without challenges, as the team has been decimated by injuries. We've had a uh, uh, large number of injuries that have been uh, serious to the point that a number of players have missed games. Um, we're starting to get a few of those back now. Uh, but injury's been a huge, huge obstacle for us this year. Adversity is no stranger for the team after the Thunder got a jump start on the season with a summer missions trip to Brazil and Paraguay. That experience has given the Thunder strength to draw from in an unrelenting season. I'm not sure we'd be where we are this year without that trip. Um, I'm not a big believer that every player has to like each other in order to play at a, a high level. However, they do need to get to know each other and to respect each other, and I think our trip was great for that. With that in mind, coach and player alike believe that with the team's overall health improving, Wheaton's best soccer is still ahead of them. We need to get healthy. Um, we're getting a few players back, like I said, if we can do that over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, I'm not sure we played our best soccer yet. In fact, I'm, I'm quite positive we have not seen that. I think we find a way to win, but I don't think we've played our best game yet which has a sign to be really discouraging coming into playoffs, but at the same time, I know that we can. I've seen bits and pieces of it this year, and I know that we have the, the talent and the capability to play and to be the number one team in the country at the end of the season. Reporting for NSCAA TV, I'm Judah Newby. Thanks for a great report, Judah. In NAI Women Action, for the second straight edition, Lindsey Wilson held the number one spot in the NAI Women's RPI. Rounding out the top five were number two, Westmont from California, number three, Vanguard, also from California, number four, Northwood from Florida, and number five, Concordia from Oregon. Concordia coach Greg Landy, currently second on the NAI active wins list, became the second active coach with 300 or more wins when the Cavaliers knocked off Oregon Tech 9-0 on October 19th. Concordia of California and Westmont, also of California, enter the week as the NAIA women's soccer's only unbeaten teams. Both squads boast a 12-0-3 mark and have two matches remaining in the regular season. And the largest upset of the weekend, unranked, 
Northwestern Ohio defeated Wolverine Hoosier Athletic Conference rival number seven Davenport for Michigan 2 0. All right, let's take a look now at NJCAA Division Three here as we roll on, and you take a look at it right there. Cerritos College still number one at 13 0 1. They just keep on rolling along. Cerritos College is on top, and uh, regular season's about to end, and they'll be ready for the playoffs. All right, finally, as you look at it, uh, SUNY Broom is in there. And then how about women Division One at the junior college level? And once again, the number one team keeps rolling. Paradise Valley has done a great job this year, and they're staying on top. All right, Monroe College out of New York. As you see them there, they come in at number seven. And Jonathan Garber has made the soccer experience at Monroe much more than just wins and losses. And their director of sports development and information, Gary Axelbank, shares the Monroe Mustangs experience. Hi, my name is Jonathan Garber. I'm the head women's soccer coach of Monroe College in New Rochelle, New York. Uh, here right now on our training pitch in New Rochelle, as you can see behind me, we've got uh, our team getting ready for a big matchup coming up next week. This is a two-year-old program in NJCA Division I, but in a short period of time, the success that we've had has really uh, attracted the attention of a lot of people. Our facilities here are fantastic. As you can see behind me, I mean, as a coach, you, ca you can't ask for a better training facility. We have a 24-hour weight room that we're able to use to our disposal. And we have great indoor facilities. We have an amazing training staff here at the college. And the location, you can't beat. You're 20 minutes away from New York City. You're in the heart of New Rochelle, which is a nice small city outside of Manhattan. So you really can't ask for a better living opportunity. When you have a program that brings in so many different styles and cultures of football, it's important to really focus on the tactical awareness and game IQ uh, of our athletes just because in order to reach the, the next level, they really need to get a better understanding of the game. We understand that here in the United States, fitness and athleticism is a huge component of success at this level. So we certainly focus uh, a lot of our efforts on making sure that our athletes are game fit, are football fit, and obviously is a, uh, a year-long process. Most of our athletes come through our program with the, the goal of being able to reach the next level. And while many of them come in with an amazing level of, of skill and technical ability, particularly those athletes who have already been trained quite a bit and have a great background in football, there's still so much more to learn and so much more to develop. And the greatest challenge for us as coaches here at Monroe College is to develop a system that allows for all players to feel that they're they're part of something that they're able to contribute, something special, something unique that they bring to the table. The team is so connected. Everyone gets on with everybody. Everyone's so enthusiastic, 100% every, every training session. You just can't ask for anything more. One of the things that really makes this program special really is, is how all the, the soccer programs here work in conjunction with one another. I work as the men's assistant. Uh, the men's head coach helps so much with the women's program. And we're able to bring in such high-level players and such great kids simply because of the fact that we create an environment that's really conducive for these students to come into and feel like they're part of something bigger than just soccer. Most of the time, it's all about winning for most programs but here it's like every day we're just here to get better and better and better and I feel like everyone here is to get better and everybody is getting better and myself I feel like I've improved. So the winning and losing in the typical sense in the sense that you hear most coaches talk about that that for us is kind of uh, elementary it's, it's secondary it's every single day earning the day and that's the way that you win and we've been able to to win in the traditional sense because we've been following that model pretty closely. Come on Annie. Nice little scream as we get ready for Halloween. I love this program, getting to know these smaller schools. But back to the Division One level for women, Virginia and Steve Swatson. Have we been rolling along in this program? Notre Dame comes to town, they beat him. They come into Chapel Hill, beat North Carolina. Last week, Florida State, you mentioned Virginia Tech, for the top five in the ACC lead Division One women. No question. Uh, the ACC is very difficult. They uh, have their last regular season game on Thursday for almost everybody. Virginia Tech comes to town. Chugger Adair has done a great job there. Only two losses. They lost to Florida State last weekend, but they're going into Virginia to play at Virginia. Virginia, of course, uh, will get home field advantage uh, for the first round, which will be on Sunday, and then they uh, all come to, uh, well, the top four come to uh, carry to Wake Med Soccer Park to play there, but they are very good in the top four out of the top five, but the whole ACC is very difficult. All right, Charlie, good spending some time with you as we roll on. Got to remind you that we've got two more games on NSCAA TV. Division I matchups on the men's side. William and Mary 
We'll welcome in James Madison. We'll show that to you a week from tomorrow, Wednesday, November 6th. And then Friday, November 8th, up in Philadelphia, it's Army and Navy. I cannot wait as we continue to bring you great college soccer action right here on NSCAA TV. And we'll be right back here at the Continental Tire Studios next week for another edition of the NSCAA Weekly College Highlights and Ranking Show. That's Tuesday, November 5th at 1 p.m. What a great show it's been. I thank you so much and thank everybody that was involved, especially Larissa White, our star reporter, getting it done out on the West Coast. I want to thank all the SIDs as well. And, of course, we got to thank the top man at NSCA, Joe Cummings, and his fantastic crew, including Kathleen Hermesh, who does a, such a wonderful job with all of the graphics and keeping the show moving. I want to thank my main man, Charlie Slagle, as well, and our director and producers, everybody involved here with the NSCA Highlight Show. Today's show, of course, is presented by the good folks from the NSCAA. You can learn more by visiting NSCAA.com. I'm Dean Linke saying so long from the Continental Tire Studios in Chapel Hill, and thanks for watching NSCAA-TV.